And so we talked about what it means to submit to government and to bosses and to your spouse. But ultimately, here's the thing. We're going to lean into another really fun topic that you're all going to love today. Suffering for righteousness' sake. How many of you like suffering? Got a, okay, I see a, a couple of hands that kind of do one of these. Like, I don't want to admit that I like suffering. But ultimately, we have to suffer for righteousness' sake. Because if we want to say that we are in Christ, that we are a new creation, we want to celebrate things like water baptism, that means we are becoming more like Jesus and less like ourselves. And as we become more like Jesus and less like ourselves, we have to look to the example of what Jesus actually did. He died on a cross for you. Amen. And he didn't just die on a cross for you. He died on a cross for everyone. Amen. Even the people that you don't like very much. Even as I always like saying, even for the crazy uncle, the crazy aunt, you think to yourself, well, I don't have a crazy un uh, aunt or an uncle. That might mean that it's you and your family. That's okay. We'll pray for you too. <laughs> but ultimately, we just have to realize this is that suffering for righteousness' sake is a reward of being a Christian. It's not a punishment for being different than the world. And too often, I think today, we want to say, like, you have, this, you have to stop being mean to me. We're, we're a Christian nation. We're this. We're that. And we start kind of pushing all these things. At what point do we embrace the fact that our Lord and Savior suffered on our behalf and we have the right to suffer on behalf of him? That, that's a moment for an amen right there, but a lot of us don't want to give it because that means, well, I don't get to do the things I want. I don't get to experience it. But remember, living hope means living holy. So if we're not really to, to live holy, we're going to struggle with that living hope part. So we'll get into our passage in just a second, but would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father your, word is written, your word is written in my mind, in my mind and hidden, and hidden in, my heart. in my heart. Your word is a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. I think deep down everybody's got identity issues. How many of you would say, like, I've got everything in my life figured out, I have no problems, no issues, everything is, is good. How many of you think from time to time, like, and you don't need to actually admit this and raise your hand, but you think to yourself, like, well, I struggle with this. I struggle with that. I wish people would understand this about me. I did this, and I meant it this way, but that person perceived it this way. We struggle with our own minds sometimes trying to process, well, why, why is it that I do what I do? Why is it that people perceive the things that I do? And then ultimately, we want to be comfortable ourselves, but we become uncomfortable with how people perceive us or how we think they're perceiving us when ultimately they're not even thinking about us. I mean, how many of you go back to like 10, 20, 30 years ago and you say, I really regret doing this thing because this person must think I'm a complete jerk for what I did 10 years ago and they've never forgiven me and ultimately they don't even remember what you, if you brought it up to them today, they probably wouldn't even remember it. Or you push yourself all the way back to, to college or high school or middle school, like, well, I was really mean to that person and all of a sudden if you were to pull them in the room today, like, I don't even remember your name. I remember as a youth pastor, I would tell that to the kids, like, don't let individuals ruin your life now that 10 years from now, you won't remember their name. And so ultimately, we have to realize this is that we want to live the way that God has called us to live. We want to live in his truth. We want to do what God has called us to do. But ultimately, we want to be perceived as Christians, not perceived as people of the world. Now, you all know that I'm a marathon runner. And here's the thing, if you said, like, help me become a marathon runner, I could get you in the right shoes, I could get you with the right socks, the right socks do matter. Some of you would laugh at me if you saw my feet when I ran, I run with toe socks on. And sometimes if I'm out of regular socks and I put on toe socks, people would, do you really wear those? Yes, because I don't like blisters on my toes. And when you start running for 20 plus miles, all of a sudden you will get blisters on your toes. There are some individuals that they will lose toenails over running that long. Thankfully, that's never happened to me. But I can get you in the right socks. I can get you in the right shirt. I can get you in the right everything. I can get you the right nutrition. Not to say that my method is perfect, but I've done a couple of them. But if I got you in all the right clothing, all the right nutrition, told you the right strategy, but you never actually took the first step, you're not a marathon runner. You're a fraud. 
And that's really easy to accept and that's really easy to understand. But when it comes to Christianity, we flip that. I'm like, well, I go to church. That means I'm a Christian. No, that means you attend a place where Christians go to worship God. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually following God. You see, it's easy for me to come here and say, well, I'm, I'm going to go to church and I will be a Christian. That's the same, I mean, you probably have heard this before. That's the same strategy as saying, I'm in a garage, I'm a car. It's a ridiculous statement, but ultimately we have to say, it's not just where I am or what I'm, um, I'm hoping to do, it's what I'm actively doing. It's the part of Christianity that I think hangs us up sometimes because we want to say, well, I said the prayer when I went to vacation Bible school once upon a time. That means I'm a Christian. No, it's the matter of accepting Jesus and then allowing Jesus to begin changing every element of how you live. Now, you hear me say this once in a while. I am a nerd. I'm a geek. I love superhero movies. I love Star Wars. I love all that stuff. Uh, but one of the superhero movies that just kind of really connected with this was Batman Begins. And there's a scene where Bruce Wayne is making some foolish decisions. He's throwing a big party. He's making a scene to show off his wealth. And his love interest sees this. He gets embarrassed. He tries to convince her that deep down, I'm really a good guy. Now, pause for a second. How many of you have ever made that statement to someone, well, I don't know why this is going. I'm really a good person. Ultimately, we know through Scripture that we've all been born into sin on our own. We're not good people. The quicker you get to a spot of realizing I'm not good on my own accord, I'm only good because Jesus Christ is in me, the quicker your life begins to change and you start saying, okay, God, do what you want with me. But so Bruce Wayne, which, spoiler alert, he is Batman. If you don't know that by now, that's, that's too bad for you. Uh, but deep down, he, he wants her to know that he's not a bad person. And she makes the claim back, it's not who you are underneath, but it's what you do that defines you. I would even beg to differ that it's what you are underneath and it is what you do in the world. Because ultimately, out of what your heart is, is what flows out of your life. It's kind of that combination of the two. But I think so often it's easy to be one or the other. It's easy to give the fake look on the outside, look at me, look at all the things I'm doing, and then deep down in your heart you're something else. Or you can be deep down in your heart like, I've got all the right answers. But I'm not going to actually share it with anybody because if I share it, they might think of me differently. It's that idea that when people find out that I'm a pastor instantly, it's, it's amazing how, and you, probably some of you unintentionally do it, but you're like, well, Pastor Scott's around. I've got to change what I'm saying. I've got to change the topic that we're talking about. we got to now all of a sudden go from talking about sports to talking about John 3.16. <laughs> I like sports too. <laughs> and it's, it's always amazing watching when I'm around people that they find out that I'm a pastor and then all of a sudden like they no longer have an issue with profanity. It just like disappears at the snap <laughs> of a finger. But here's the thing that I want to challenge you with is that if you are truly in Christ, people should know that there's something different about you. You should be experiencing that same thing. It's frustrating, trust me. But at the same time, I, it's one of the reasons I don't usually lead with a lot of people that I don't know that I'm a pastor because I like being perceived as a person that can have a conversation with them and not end up instantly think like, well, you're here to, uh, to change me. You're here to, to tell me about Jesus. Like, no, I'm here to just share the love of Jesus. And then ultimately, here's the thing I want to say. Suffering reveals your character and persecution reveals your faith. So when we say, I don't want to suffer, I don't want persecution, ultimately what you're saying is, I don't want what's inside of me to be revealed because I don't like it as much. We start saying, well, if all of a sudden the world starts persecuting the church, well, then it's not going to be really nice and we don't, won't have the freedoms. No, there's, the Chinese church is able to thrive under persecution. Why? Because their faith is authentic. <laughs> I kind of embrace the idea of the American church being persecuted because I think it will root out all the people who are faking it and allow the church to actually grow, thrive, and be real for once mm -hmm. and not be hypocritical. It's one of those things that I think we kind of desperately need. And so as we look at 1 Peter the chapters 3 and 4 today, we're going to take a close look at what it means to own our faith and how we can demonstrate our, our faith as followers of Jesus. So we're going to start right now uh, in... I'm sorry, I'm the other page. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. 
Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteousness for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. First point out of this message today is choose good. Choose good. And this is going to be one of those messages that I'll tell you that even as I'm preaching it, I'm preaching it just as much to myself as I'm preaching it to you today. Peter has been writing to these Christians about how to live in a way that shows you love Jesus in the midst of a world that doesn't. While he's writing to different people at a different time, it's so applicable to us today. The topic stresses the importance of unity and love within the church. Our habits are essential to this message. We have to choose to do the good that God calls us individually to do. If people see the church fighting within the church, people will look at the church as we are hypocritical. We teach that God loves the world and wants to restore everyone to himself and with, with each other. But why would anyone want what we have if all we demonstrate is frustrating relationships and yelling and screaming and fighting within churches and with other Christians? And especially when we lead with, well, God hates you because you do this. No, God doesn't hate. God hates sin. And you are not defined by your sin. You're defined by your Savior. Mm -hmm. It can remind you of when you look at political campaigns or famous celebrities. When all of a sudden they get up and they give a speech and you say, well, your message is good, but your actions behind it are bad. The, the idea of I'm going to tell you to do this, but then I'm going to do the opposite and I'm going to try and justify my actions. And hear this. It's Democrats. It's Republicans. It's good celebrities. It's bad celebrities. It's your only role model of how to live the Christian life is not me, it's not someone else in this room, it's Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when you look at someone and say, well, this person is against us, then start praying for them. You're never going to hear me say, well, okay, it's okay to, you can love 99% of people, but that 1% of the people in the world, you, you, it's okay to hate them. No, we should be striving to intentionally do what God has called us to do. We as a church must choose to be on the same page, caring about one another, being aware of what others need, realizing that maybe we aren't the most important person in every room that we walk into. And that's something that we have to continue to remind ourselves, that we are not the most important person. Why? Because when we have become a new creation in Jesus, the most important person in the room is the one that doesn't know Jesus. And what God's calling you to do is what you're supposed to do. We must choose to de-escalate conflict rather than fight for what we think that we deserve. It's not about you. The moment you said yes to Jesus, it stopped being about you. I think one of the things that's so fascinating with Christians is this, is that we all kind of have this mentality of, can you believe that that person that doesn't believe in an almighty God, all, almighty creator of the universe, is sitting and doing whatever they want? 
Isn't that what we all did until before we accepted Jesus? And we try to hold them to a standard that we don't necessarily hold ourselves to. And it's interesting that we pick out the sins that we don't particularly struggle with. And I've told you before, I'm a really bad liar. <laughs> if you want to be able to, to catch me in something, it's lying because I'm, I'm just not good at it. Like, some of you are like, I'm an expert liar. I can get away with anything. I could, I, I could have a dead body in my backyard and I can look a police officer square in the face and convince them that I, I don't know what you're talking about, officer. <laughs> me, I'd, I'd be sweating after rolling a one. I'm like, it's me, I'm guilty. Like, hi, it's me, I'm the problem, it's me. <laughs> but we must choose to do good and we must intentionally say, you know what? I might be struggling with this issue, you might be struggling with that issue, but the Holy Spirit needs to come in and, and work on all of us together. And Peter is saying that we need to choose good, and some, when something goes wrong and we suffer, it's okay. Because God's going to be behind us, God's going to reward us, God's going to take care of us. Those are some of those moments where you say, you know what, okay God, you want me to, to give and you want me to invest into the kingdom, I'm going to trust that you're going to provide for me. God, you want me to go out and do this? Well, I might get persecuted. Okay, you're going to be there for me. It's this idea and this mentality that when we are uh, doing what God has called us to do, the worst thing that somebody can do to us is kill us and send us to go to be in the presence of Jesus. And if they can't do that, it just gives us a better testimony to tell more people about Jesus about it. So why are we so worked up and why are we so upset of what the world is doing? What's God calling us to do? When we look at verses 15 and 16, it sees that we must always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for our reason of hope that's in us. What's our reason of hope? That living hope that we have, it's the holiness that we live. When we start living holy, all of a sudden hope can come out. And when hope comes out, people will look at us and what is it that's different about you because you have something that I don't have. And what's that thing that I don't have? It's hope because I know that I'm not living for today. I'm not living for tomorrow. I'm not living for retirement in the future someday. I'm living for an eternal kingdom where I'm with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this moment where we have to intentionally say that, okay, God, whatever it is you want from me, you get what it is. And I need to choose to do good. When we look at the people that... We say, well, that person really changed the world. They changed it for the better. That is doing something great. It's doing something unique. It's oftentimes not the people that get the publicity. It's the person behind the scenes that's faithfully plodding along, doing what God's called them to do. And so we need to look at our habits, what we're doing regularly. Are you in God's word? Are you in prayer? When we do a prayer night, will you show up for the prayer night? Or are you more interested in watching whatever is on TV that night or whatever you're filling your schedule with? Here's one thing I'll always give you an excuse for. If you're sitting one-on-one -on -one discipling somebody, go for it. But otherwise, if we're just like, you know what, I'll go to the next prayer meeting or I'll, I'll do this next time. Or The prayer meeting is the most important thing that we can do because me speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of what God told me to put together. When all of a sudden we get together as a prayer meeting, when two or more are gathered, then God moves. <laughs> but so often the prayer meeting gets thrown off simply because, well, it's just a prayer meeting. Next point is this, is choose to do good even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. No matter who you are, life is hard in moments. There's always peaks, valleys, or in-betweens, where you're either at, you're at the peak, everything is great, you're in the valley, everything is horrible, or you're somewhere in between and you're kind of riding that out. You're either moving toward the great moment, you're moving away from a great moment, or you're in that valley. And wherever it is, we have to continue to do what we know that God has called us to do. And here's ultimately a point that you just got to take, is that the gospel is salvation through sacrifice. The gospel is salvation through sacrifice. That we experience salvation because Jesus Christ sacrificed himself on our behalf. Right. And ultimately, God is calling us to sacrifice our wants, needs, desires, so that other people can experience salvation. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about us. That God doesn't just demand that we do the hard things, He did it first. Mm -hmm. And the suffering that we'll experience in life is substantially less than the suffering that Jesus went through for us. 
that God could have just destroyed evil and just said, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to start over. I'm going to try doing this or try to doing that. Instead, he sent Jesus to suffer on our behalf so that he could rescue us from being evil and bring back in the proper restoration relationship. And through his death, he claimed triumph over darkness and victory over sin. His victory didn't come with this major display of power, but it was a human humbly choosing to do good even when it was hard. And Jesus stayed so committed to doing good that he didn't stop doing good when it cost him his life, but he came back to life again. He went back into heaven, and he's coming back again. And ultimately, that's what we need to look at today is that what did Jesus do on our behalf? Peter compares this to Noah, and as we even had this perfect timing that... Uh, when this message was written, we weren't sure when the water baptism was going to happen, but you hear this with Noah of how God rescued Noah and his family through the water. It's the same kind of thing when we do water baptism today. It's why I, every time we do a baptism, I, I love the fact, I think this is in the last like, two months, I think this is the eighth baptism we've had. There's obviously something that God's doing, but here's the thing I want you to realize is that when we watch a baptism, and you remember when you were baptized, it's this idea that all of a sudden something is changing because you are making a public declaration of who Jesus Christ is. And let me encourage you that you might say, well, I've been in church forever, I believe in Jesus, I'm reading my Bible diligently, I'm praying diligently. If you haven't been water baptized, what are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. Literally what scripture says is like, what are you waiting for? Do it already. Make that public declaration if you're following after Jesus. Don't say, well, I've been a Christian for 20 years, and all of a sudden, if I get baptized, people are going to wonder. They're going to celebrate the fact that you're just making the public declaration. It's not like water baptism doesn't get you into heaven, but when God calls us to do something, how do you know that we should do it? Because we're choosing to do good. Now, it's these moments where it's easy to say, okay, God, I will do what you want me to do when it's easy. It's really easy to make that kind of declaration of saying, well, I'm already a bad liar, so God, I'm just not going to lie. Or God, I'm already, I have no interest in this sin or that sin, so I'm just going to not do those things. No, we're called to live holy, which means all areas of our life, all the things that we're good at, all the things that we struggle with. Jesus' victory came through consistent humility, serving as a model for us, and we need to get to a spot where we're representing Jesus and being a consistent, humble model for others. Peter not only teaches that in these letters that we're reading, but even lives it out. So in Acts 5, 41, here's what we see first. We're going to start with what ended up happening. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So Peter's a part of this grouping, and he walks away being excited that he gets to suffer for Jesus. I want you to think of that for a moment. When's the last time you truly said, okay, God, I am grateful that I'm getting to suffer right now? Because realistically, that's not something that's typically in our vocabulary. Of, I'm excited for suffering. But when we look at this, here's why we can see this, because we, we put this in the proper context. So we go back to uh, Acts 5, 17 through 39, and hear the whole context of this. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prisons, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captains with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they had set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in the name, in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man its blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. 
The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thudias rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. That's why Peter and the apostles, they can celebrate because they know, hey, we're doing what God Almighty has called us to do. This wasn't some man that came up with a plan. This was a grouping of people that said, we are going to put our lives out there for the purpose of making the name of Jesus famous. And they were okay. You throw me in prison, not a big deal. You're going to tell me don't preach the gospel? I'm going to go and preach the gospel anyways. We're going to be consistent in doing what we know is right to do. And no matter what you do to us, it's okay. Because either you're going to throw me in prison, and I'll preach to those that are in prison. You're going to kill me, I'm going to go to heaven. It doesn't really matter. I live for another master now, and that master is Jesus Christ. And for each and every one of us in this room, we have to get to a spot. And this is, for some of us, it can get there quicker. For some of us, it's a lifelong journey. But we have to be willing to say, I'm willing to lay down everything in my life that is not of God for the purpose of Jesus Christ. Because the things of this world are fleeting. They don't matter. They're insignificant in uh, the perspective of eternity. And I'm willing to lay it down so that Jesus' name can be made famous. So what does it look like to choose good? At its most basic concept, it means that we need to live differently. And that's where the, the, the rubber hits the road here, is that we have to be willing to live differently. There's something fundamental that we have to make a decision on. So this is 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time of the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that it passes suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Christ suffered for us, not so that we could live the way that we used to and just have a, an escape plan and how we're going to get out of hell. And if we treat that as an escape plan of how we're going to escape hell, we're, we're approaching this all in the wrong mentality. This whole Christian walk is about living and being different. He suffered so that we could pursue something other than our destructive desires. It makes sense for those who don't know Jesus to follow those. Because here's the thing. If Jesus isn't God, if Jesus wasn't the Son of God and lived the perfect life and died on the cross on every half and was resurrected and coming again, if that's not true, then why don't you just do whatever you want? 
it's really easy to say, like, if, if there is no God, go and literally do whatever you want. But if there is a God, and we acknowledge him, and his son is Jesus, and we accept Jesus into our lives, it has to change how we live. Mm -hmm. Because why else would God send him in the first place? It wasn't just for fun. It wasn't so, let's hang out with Jesus, let's have a best friend in Jesus. No, we, he sent Jesus so that we could be redeemed and restored and spend eternity with God in heaven. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference there, that following Jesus will make you stand out. In, in good ways and bad ways, there'll be moments where you think, like, can you just treat me like you used to treat me? No, because they see something different in you. They see living hope because they see you living holy. And that we need to follow Jesus so that we look different from those who don't. So that we can present a model of here's something else you can do. Here's a different direction you can go in. Let me show you how you can have hope. And when you start questioning about that hope, I can show you about how you get that hope. And it's by living holy. And it's by laying down the things that you think you want for the things that you actually need. And people who aren't following Christ, they're not going to be able to understand it on the surface. They're going to look at it. It's not going to make a lot of sense to them. But that's why you just continually living um, full of hope and living holy and they're just going to start asking questions and that's why when people ask questions you have to be ready to give an account for the hope that you have mm -hmm. and that's your moment of being able to share a testimony on a week like last week where I had four individuals come up and share different things that God spoke to them I gave them about a two weeks warning of hey this is what I want you to do I want you to speak to us as if we were your children and what God is using you to speak to your children about. You need to be ready and willing to give that kind of account when someone says, well, why is it that you go to church? You got to have an answer besides, well, I just always have. It becomes a moment of saying, because Jesus Christ did this in my life. He radically changed me. He transformed me. He saved me from a path that I was going down and brought me along a different path. That when I was going through a sickness, all of a sudden there was a healing in the doctors. It didn't make any sense to them, but there was a supernatural healing that took place. That I was addicted to something, and then all of a sudden God just removed the addiction, and it didn't make any sense. That I didn't need to go through some rehabilitation. I was able to just go and go from a spot of being addicted to being free. Whatever it is that I was dealing with anger, and then all of a sudden God just removed the anger, and I'm not that person anymore. There's a fundamental difference. you got to be willing and ready to share the account of what God has done because as you live holy, you'll have living hope, and as you have living hope, you have something to offer people. Peter says later at the end of the chapter that suffering for doing something wrong doesn't help anyone. If you actually des deserve uh, to, to, be, to, to walk through difficult times and you, you struggle with things, God's going to be there for you if you continue to do what God's called you to do. Now, here's the thing that we can notice in our society today. Everybody is really, really quick to want to cancel people. Everyone's quick. And you, and you, you might be thinking in your mind, I can think of this grouping of people that all they want to do is cancel Everybody wants to cancel. D don't treat yourself as any higher than anyone else. Everyone in this room, there's things and situations and people you're like, I wish I could just cancel that. Like, I mean, there's moments where you can say, I'm going to go home and I'm going to cancel this subscription or that subscription. It kind of feels nice because all of a sudden if I cancel a subscription, that means there's more money coming back into my bank account or less leaving my bank account. Or I didn't need that anymore. I'm going to cancel that. But when we approach people as saying, I'm going to cancel that person, what you're doing is you're canceling the ability to have a relationship with that person and speak truth into their life. You see, all of a sudden, this, and I said this a couple weeks ago, this is the reason why you just don't hear me talking about boycotts. Is there's moments, and you can even see um, right now in our nation, in both directions, how boycotts are happening and this business is either thriving or this business is going down. Here's the thing, as a Christian, we should be looking to have an interaction with every single person because every single person was created in the image of God. We should not be looking to cancel people. Mm -hmm. But realize that when you are living holy and living uh, in a living hope, that people might want to cancel you. So let me say this. It's okay if somebody chooses to cancel you if you're living holy and you're living righteous and you're doing it in a way of love. I always come back to this. You have to speak truth. You have to speak it in love. 
if you just speak truth and just like spewing it out, if this is truth and you're going to do something about it, you're going to go to hell. You're missing the whole point of the gospel. The only people that Jesus, you see him get upset with on a consistent basis, are the religious leaders that are hitting people upside uh, the head with the Old Testament. At the same time, what's our model of Jesus and how he does it? He goes up to people, he approaches them, he walks them through their issues, and then says, now go and sin no more. So God gives them truth as Jesus speaks to them, and then gives them hope, and then calls them to a higher standard. Jesus is calling them to live holy so that they have living hope, so that they can now give an account to other people of how they should live. That's the model that Jesus does. That's the model that we need to. And if somebody wants to cancel you because you're following the example of Jesus, then that's cool. But if you're trying to advance the gospel in your own way, if I'm trying to preach the gospel to Scott, it's going to fail and somebody's going to cancel me. And it's probably going to be for the right reason. If you start saying, well, this is the way I want it to be. And if, if they don't like it, then forget them. That's not how we do this Christianity thing. That Jesus is the only stumbling block. Jesus is also the cornerstone on which we build our lives. So if they trip over the cornerstone, that's on them. But I'm not intentionally throwing myself out underneath people to try and trip them and prevent them from experiencing Jesus. I've got no interest in canceling a person. The only thing I have the desire to cancel is Satan. And how do I do that? Through Jesus, not my own abilities, not my own wants. I do that by doing the next thing good thing. And I do the next good thing by ultimately pushing Jesus Christ and making Jesus Christ famous. That ultimately, whatever you have going on, if you're smart, use your wisdom, your abilities, and your talents to advance the kingdom. If you have resources, use the resources to advance the kingdom. And let me encourage you with this. Each and every one of us, we live in America. We live, I'm going to take it Take a pretty good guess that we all have indoor plumbing in here, right? Everybody have indoor plumbing? That means you're in the top, I believe it's 2 to 3% of the world's wealth. Please, let's stop acting like we're, we're these poor individuals that don't have anything. You have running water in your house. You do not have to walk miles to get potentially dirty water. Let's stop pretending like we don't have anything. You just don't have everything that you want. And when you don't have everything that you want, you start trying to keep up with the Joneses. And when you keep up with the Joneses, all you do is get yourself in debt and remove your ability to be able to give to what God calls you to do. And because you're not able to give to what God calls you to do, you're walking in disobedience because it was more important to have the thing that you want to impress the people that don't even know that you're trying to impress them. But if we were to say, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do? Let me lay down my wants and needs and desires. I can now follow after what God has for me, and God will meet what my needs are. Do we trust God or do we not trust God? Do we trust and say, okay, God, you're in charge of everything except for my finances. You're in charge of everything except for what I get to watch on TV. God, you can be in charge of everything except for how I speak to people. No, it's either God has control of everything or he has control of nothing. Mm -hmm. Because you don't get to tell the almighty God of the universe of this 90% you can have because I'm not struggling with that 90%, but the 10% that I do struggle with, this is still mine, God. Jesus came for all. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be effective in reaching the world for Jesus Christ, that means that we have to give it all to him. If I have the worship team, go ahead and come up. Many of you would, would agree that God is real and that Jesus is God and that Jesus died for our sins, was resurrected, and is returning. And so when I said it earlier, there was amen, there was excitement. But do we actually choose to follow God when it poses the most minor inconveniences to us? Now, there's moments where you can look at it and say, but this is a big inconvenience. This is a small inconvenience. I don't really know what, ultimately, here's the thing that I need you to, to know and need you to realize, is that if God's calling you to do it, you got to do it. You have to do that next good thing. Whatever it is, you have to continue to do it. And I would challenge you to reflect and ask yourself this today. Like, what is it that when, when it's hard that I wanted to say, no, God, you can't have this area? Because ultimately, that's probably the area that God's trying to speak to you in. And ultimately, are we looking to, to follow Jesus or are we just trying to claim that we follow Jesus? Because if we're looking to follow Jesus, that means we have to lay those things down. 
If we want to see people changed and transformed, it's exciting see, watching three students get water baptized. It's what I say all the time. I would love to fill this tank up every single week because there's someone that wants to make a public declaration of what Jesus Christ is doing in their life. In order to see that happen, in order for that to, to occur, that means that we as a church need to all be playing our part because a church grows much faster when you deal with multiplication instead of addition. Mm -hmm. If you're waiting, well, that person, they're really good at the gift of evangelism, so I'm just going to let them tell the people about Jesus. And we'll let them add one by one that oh, that person, they're pregnant and they just have a baby. The church grew. Well, yeah, that's true. But, and by the way, Jordan, you did have a baby. So, the church is experiencing growth. <laughs> but, here's, here's the thing. I want to see church grow because your loved ones, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, who are far from God, all of a sudden experience living hope because you were living holy and pointing them to Jesus and you were able to give an account for the good that was in your life and what God's done and now all of a sudden they're experiencing it and what happens when they experience it, they start telling even more people. Because think, I want you to think of an event in your life that you witnessed at some point in time in your life. Whether it was a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, think of it in the past. It's harder to tell the full story of it today than it was 10 years ago. Because when you experience it in that particular moment, it's very fresh in your mind. And it's very real. And it's very transformative. And as time goes by, it still matters. It still shapes who you are. It's gotten you where you are. But ultimately, it doesn't have as much uh, sharpness to the memory sometimes. But for someone that just meets Jesus... And all of a sudden, their life just radically changed. It radically transformed that God just broke them free of things that they've been trying to break free of, of their own for years. They want to go and tell people about that because they know people that need to have what they just experienced. Mm -hmm. And as a church, as we pour in and we invest in people, you're going to watch that begin to happen. It becomes exciting. And the church gets a little bit messy sometimes. But as the church gets messy, all of a sudden, the church also gets cleaned up because we're experiencing water baptism. We're watching people make public declarations, and there's excitement, and there's life. I don't want to be a morgue. I want to be an emergency room where all of a sudden, it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit hectic. But lives are being saved. Amen? Yeah. Will you just stand up? We're going to sing Waymaker. Because this is just, to me, I love this song and just in that sense that you don't always know what God's doing in your life. You may not always be able to see it. You may not always be able to understand it. But know this. God is working. God is working in your midst that God is trying to do something. But you might just have to get yourself out of the way at times. And say, okay, God, this is on me. God, this is on you. You've got to do something here. I need you to show up. I need you to provide. I need you to do this. I'm going to do this living holy part. So that I can experience the living hope. And when we experience the living hope, that's when God shows up. And when we all do it together, we start seeing the church begin to thrive. And the church begin to grow. And the church begin to be able to change the community. And we don't do it by trying to protest our way into change. We do it by loving our way into change. And all of a sudden, we get the result that we always wanted, but we get it in the way that God always intended for it. So this morning, as we just sing Waymaker, if there's something that's going on in your life, feel free. The altars are open. Nobody's going to be looking at you, but if you need to come before God and just surrender and say, I just need to get this off, God, like I need you to do something, I need you to move, come to the altar. Just give it up to God today. Stop pulling on to it for yourself. But let's just worship the King this morning.